And welcome to the 17th meeting of the Health and Sports Committee in 2019. Uh, we have received apologies this morning from David Stewart, MSP, uh, and Anna Sarwar is attending as a substitute member. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure mobile phones are off or on silent uh, and not to use uh, mobile devices for recording or photography. The first item on the agenda today is subordinate legislation and consideration of a negative instrument. The negative instrument is the National Assistance Assessment of Resources Amendment Scotland No. 2 Regulations 2019. Uh, the, these effectively allow advanced payments to survivors of child sexual abuse uh, who are over 70 or terminally ill uh, for those payments not to affect local authority assessments for charging for care. Uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered this instrument on the 18th of June and determined that it did not need to draw the attention of Parliament to this instrument on any grounds uh, within its remit. Uh, if it's approved, it, it will be due to come into force on Friday of this week. Uh, do members have any comments on this instrument? If not, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? Agreed. That is agreed. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is an evidence session with NHS 5. This is part of a series of evidence sessions which the committee is holding with territorial health boards. Can I welcome to the committee the Right Honourable Tish, Tricia Marwick, uh, Chair of NHS 5, and I resist the temptation to add MSP at the end of that name, uh, Paul Hawkins, the Chief Executive, uh, Michael Kellett, Director of Health and Social Care uh, and Chief Officer of the 5 IGB, Carol Potter, Director of Finance and Performance, uh, Barbara Ann Nelson, the Director of Workforce, uh, and Chris McKenna, the Medical Director. Can I welcome you all to the committee? Uh, look forward to your evidence. Uh, and can I start um, the evidence uh, session by asking about uh, the financial position uh, of NHS 5 and in particular what progress the board is making uh, to ensure that savings are achieved on a recurring and sustainable uh, basis going forward? Thank Carol you. Potter. Thank you. Um, so just I guess as, as context for, for colleagues in the room, NHS Fife, we spend around £2 million on a daily basis providing health and care to the, the population of Fife. Over the last financial year, um, very much uh, in terms of working with our staff, um, our budget holders and obviously the public, we have had very strong and effective financial management and financial control. We have delivered our financial targets um, once again uh, without any additional um, funding support through brokerage from Scottish Government. And we've been very focused on balancing our financial position with our operational performance as well, in terms of waiting times in other particular areas. Um, as we go into the new financial year, um, obviously we're coming into the, the end of the first quarter, the financial position for this year is challenging and, and, and uh, absolutely prevalent, um, particularly within our acute services where we're facing around about a 6% um, efficiency requirement this year. On a positive, we have started this financial year, although there's a recurring gap in our financial position, what we've seen since 2016 is um, year by year, we've been moving um, to reduce that. So this uh, financial year, we've started with a £17 million recurring gap. So you'll, that you know, demonstrates that move over the last few years. Um, what we have done um, for the current financial year is very much, um, we're working to refresh what we call our transformation approach, um, working with colleagues in, in the health and social care partnership on a system-wide basis. Um, a very good example of where Fife has delivered um, effective um, recurring savings through a sort of system-wide approach, as I would describe it, is in relation to our medicines programme. So we have seen um, significant uh, savings of the magnitude of the millions in terms of looking at our medicines waste, um, reviewing our formulary and also formulary compliance as well. So it's been a very positive piece of work um, that our pharmacy colleagues have undertaken alongside um, our GPs and our, our acute clinicians as well. So um, it is challenging, but we're making progress um, around what I would describe as the good housekeeping, looking at um, all areas, areas of supply, procurement and supplies, for example, as well as really getting into conversations about redesign and transformation, which obviously some of my colleagues could also comment on. Thank you very much. Clearly, these are uh, challenging uh, times. Uh, I wonder if Michael Kellett wants to add anything from the point of view of the IJB. Thank you, convener. Not to add anything to, to really to what Carol says uh, is a challenging position. We work very closely with colleagues uh, in NHS Fife 
uh, the financial position of the, the partnership it has been a, a challenge, uh, but it's one we're uh, very focused on working in partnership with colleagues in NHS Fife and uh, Fife Council uh, to move the partnership towards financial balance in the medium term, and that's an absolute focus uh, for us. But Carol sets out the position uh, very well in terms of the, the positions uh, of NHS and, and also the position of the Health and Social Care Partnership. Clearly, some of these are sh shorter term perspectives. I wonder uh, what the board would like to say about the prospects of developing longer term financial planning. Uh, what uh, 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 what steps are being taken towards that, and 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 and, and uh, whether there are any barriers to taking that forward? Yes, we've got we got another a number of transformation projects that we're working on. We're looking at mental health redesign. Uh, we're looking at transforming the acute services. Some of the areas we've started to work on is how we can actually provide care for patients faster and quicker in queues. Uh, we've implemented um, some new ways of doing ophthalmology that's um, leading edge in terms of Jack and Jill theatres, which means um, consultants can walk between theatres to speed up some, some of the services. Um, we've done uh, in a day HIP, 23-hour uh, HIPs, which um, is moving across Scotland now for patients that are fairly healthy having their HIPs done. So we're evolving a process of clinical pathways and change, but on top of that, we're trying to transform our services as well. We've got um, care in the community work that we're working through. So we've got lots of long-term goals. Obviously, the financial sustainability is the issue to get there and the workforce issues, which are becoming more difficult in terms of um, recruiting consultants and other staff at the same time. Can I just say on behalf of... Yes, thank you very much, convener. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, can I just say that there's a high degree of confidence within a uh, Fife NHS board in terms of the executives and the non-executives about our financial position. We recognise it is challenging. It's been challenging for the last uh, two years. Notwithstanding that, um, we are one of the few boards in Scotland that have actually broken even and we have not required any brokerage at all from the Scottish Government to do so. Um, so while the situation is challenging, we are confident that we've got um, the financial um, strategies and plans and housekeeping, um, you know, the grip and control that we need on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to ensure that there is a high level of confidence that when we come to the end of the next financial year, we will continue to be in a good financial position. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everyone. I'm interested in set-aside budgets. Um, we've taken a lot of evidence from various boards, and we've even heard that NHS and Friesen Galloway don't even call set-aside set-aside. They use a completely different model. So I'm interested to hear whether you think the set-aside budget is being managed effectively, and uh, how how is it being managed would be a, a fair question, I suppose, to ask, and if you could give us some background about that. Um, thank, thank you. Uh, the set aside budget is um, it's a, a conversation topic um, that's very prevalent at the moment. Um, we're working with uh, Michael and colleagues in the Health and Social Care Partnership and the IGB around the, the, the set aside and also with the Chief Operating Officer in our acute service. Um, I think the transition um, to, to move those resources, if you like, into the partnership is a challenging one. Um, I think it's early days at the moment. Um, the recent submission that we provided in relation to the um, health and social care, as we called it, a stock take. Um, we have described in there that there is further discussion required. Um, we haven't um, have a definitive time scale around moving those budgets, but what we're very much focused on is that rather than having a conversation about the set-aside budgets per se, it's very much about the clinical model and what does that actually mean for the care um, and provision of services for patients. So when we talk about unscheduled care within the acute setting um, and the front door of the hospital, etc., and changing that, that model, it's how does that then... Um, align with our, our health and social care model. So the conversation is very much one about what is the clinical model um, and what gives the best um, quality and, and safety for patients. And then the budget setting should follow that. But the, at this point in time, the conversation with colleagues across the acute sector and with the partnership is one of the clinical model first and foremost. So it's a set aside controlled by the IJB and held by the NHS. Who, who manages it? 
The, the set aside budget at present um, is within our acute services division, so it's under the, the oversight of the, the chief operating officer. It's a range of different budgets across um, me medical specialties and A and E and other unscheduled care areas. So it's a conversation at this point in time. It's very much managed and overseen by the chief operating officer, but we are moving towards the, the direction that's certainly set out in, in government um, direction of travel. Do you have timescales for that then, for moving forward? Um, from recollection, it's later in this financial year that we've got that. I'm going to perhaps confirm with, with the Chief Executive or Michael if they can confirm that. Given, given the line of questioning yeah. that Emma Harper's answered, if you could confirm uh, the, the uh, detail, but also the wider question of your responsibility for this budget. Yeah, very happy to. And Carol's set the position out. The Ministerial Steering Group uh, recommendations about integration, as, as the committee will know, made a specific recommendation that set aside was something that partnerships, and by partnerships, I suppose in five, they mean whole systems uh, need to uh, take uh, active action on, and in particular, uh, put arrangements in within six months of, of this financial year. So that's the time scale we're looking at. Uh, it, is a, it is a challenging agenda. I understand and I know that Scottish Government are working with colleagues in Ayrshire around set aside and how set aside might be managed there. And the uh, indication is that guidance and advice will be produced on the basis of that experience in, in Ayrshire. And we're obviously looking uh, to learn uh, lessons there. So it's a priority for us over the, uh, the first six months of this financial year. But as Carol said, it, it is a challenging agenda that uh, the, the um, being in a position, given the demands on the acute service as well as demands uh, on health and social care to shift resources uh, is, is a, a significant challenge, but one uh, we are uh, engaging with in terms of the clinical model uh, and also making progress that was r required uh, by us uh, in the Ministerial Steering Group uh, recommendations. OK, thanks. Before I bring in an ask, just um, briefly, the... Some of the big numbers in the financial reporting are around the risk share between the IJB and the NHS uh, board. Um, can you tell us what action is being taken in that area in regard particular to the way in which it appears that overspends are set against the IJB rather than against the board? So, so, so um, we, we're working with the, the councillors, obviously, um, the, the parent body, as is the health board, to look at the opportunities of reviewing that. At, at the moment, it's cost us, uh, in terms of a health board, sort of significant money in terms of transfer to the council, um, in terms of um, packages. Um, we're hoping that in our assessment, we can look at whether we can change those percentages, whether we can work differently about how that works. In some ways, the money does follow the patient. But the difficulty is with the um, amount of money needed in home care packages, it will outstrip some of those numbers. So we're trying to understand how we can work with a transformation plan within the acute to try and mitigate some of that as we start to go through, work in a true integrated way. Um, but it is a piece of work that we need to come to a conclusion by the end of the year in terms of moving that forward. The, um, the percentage share of the overspend sits 72% with the health board and 28% with the council. Um, so we recognise that if there is an overspend within the IJB, then 72% of that will have to be funded by uh, the health board. And that's why there are conversations going on with the health board and the council and others to see if the formula that we have and the way that um, the IJB was set up um, can be looked at once more. Figures show substantial underspends in some areas, particularly community health and overspends in others. Uh, does that give you cause for concern? That, Michael Kellett. Sorry, that, that, that is the, the, the case. Uh, 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 convener, and what, what we seek to do is look at um, the uh, budget as a whole uh, across the, the whole partnership, as well as understanding clearly the impact of the overspend on our, on our funding partners, both NHS clearly, but also uh, Fife Council. So uh, we, we, we manage the budget uh, as a whole. There are a number of uh, areas of uh, underspend and a number of areas of significant overspend as well, and we're seeking to understand that. We're also seeking to, as I've said, plan for the, the long term. We, we set a budget for the IGB this year with an acknowledged a deficit of, of 6.5 million, but gave a clear undertaking to our funding partners that we would do everything we could to bear down on that overspend in year, but also 
plan earlier for longer uh, for future years so we can move towards financial balance and therefore the impact the financial impact on our partners is is mitigated so that's something we're doing in partnership igb council and nhs uh, and those discussions are ongoing Thank you very much. I know uh, Brian Whittle will come back to those questions later in the session. Anna Sarver. Good morning, everyone, and a particular welcome to Trish Marwick. Good to see you back in the building. Um, can I ask a, gen a general question? How would you rate NHS Fife's financial performance compared to other health boards or IGBs across the country? What you need to do is, um, we, we've been very clear that um, the financial position um, needs to be balanced against our performance in terms of our clinical performance. Um, so in terms of how we're doing, um, we're one of the few boards that um, have not had to have um, support and brokerage from the government. Um, and our um, performance in terms of waiting times, etc., cetera, um, sits within the upper quartile um, of all the health boards in Scotland. So I think in, both in terms of finance and in terms of performance, we're doing fine. I'll come back in a moment about the the brokerage, but again, in terms of performance, be that either financial performance or clinical performance, where do you see the balance in terms of economic pressures or budgetary pressures versus workforce pressures? Where do you see the balance in terms of how that impacts on the challenge? I think the two are inextricably linked. Um, you know, we have um, a number of workforce challenges in particular specialties, for example, and you know, my colleague, my medical director and director of workforce are better placed to talk about specifics. But the balance of um, ensuring that we've got the right staff in the right place for you know, the, the right patient groups sometimes does come at cost. Um, and we obviously have supplementary staffing costs, for example, but we are trying to look at innovative ways to that to support the workforce model at the same time as actually sit comfortably alongside a financial position. So an example would be um, we have a very effective relationship with colleagues in Lothian around radiology. So we um, there's a particular shortage of radiologists, I think, across not just Fife, but Scotland and the UK in general. And through a, a technology solution that allowed colleagues in Lothian and Borders to report on Fife images, um, we were able to put that um, mechanism in place. So it came, um, as I say, it delivered on our um, quality, if you like, and our, our operational performance in terms of reporting on images. At the same time, it solved, um, helped to seek a solution to a workforce problem, and it came, and it was a lower cost than potentially pay, um, paying um, significant rates for um, supplementary staffing. We need to see more of that, more, more working across health boards to try and share capacity and share resource. No, I, 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 absolutely, and I think it's finding innovative solutions that support our financial position as well as um, workforce, but using innovative um, solutions, technology, or, or other ways of working. On, on two points made by Trish Mark. The, the first one was around an earlier answer you said around how the IGB was made up, and perhaps it needs to be something needs to be looked at about how that was made up. Are there any particular reforms you're thinking of in terms of how that is set up and what lessons perhaps can be learned across the rest of the country? I think the IGB has been there for three, four years, three years. Um, and the formulas um, and the way it worked um, from the beginning, um, I think all the partners in it um, need to have these conversations and look and see, are we doing the best thing we can. And I think that also um, includes the uh, funding formula. Um, and these conversations are taking place because we need to get to a, a state where the um, IGB is in a good financial position, um, as well as making sure that we can give the care um, to our, pa our patients. That requires a, a properly funded National Health Service, also properly funded local government, if that partnership's going to work. You're asking me, Mr. Sarwar, to uh, indulge in politics, um, but of course... Um, you would never do that, of course. I'd never do that, certainly not in this role, or the previous one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but what I would say is, of course, um, you know, we need um, proper funding, um, mm. but at the moment, um, the NHS Fife is doing OK in terms of the funding that we've got, but we could always do more. And, and final question, I suppose, depending on what you say, um, how does it make you feel 
that you have financial performance, you don't ask for a bailout, you don't get brokerage, it's then not written off, whereas other health boards do. How does that make you feel? I don't think it's any surprise um, that I was miffed um, that we have worked really very, very hard with in Fife to ensure um, that our financial performance has been the best it can be. Um, and it is frustrating uh, that some of the decisions that we've made along with fantastic support of our staff um, has perhaps meant there is other things, and don't ask me what they are, um, but there may have been other things we could have done if we had gone into um, financial... Um, it feels like bad behaviour is rewarded. <laughs> Mr Sarva, I, I'm not allowing you to put words in my mouth, but what I will say, um, it is a matter um, of uh, great pride in Fife uh, that we have uh, managed to break even. Um, and, you know, I, I would certainly have liked more money um, that perhaps some other um, health boards were getting in terms of brokerage. I would have liked to have seen some sort of recognition for the fact that we're doing fine. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. So I'm interested in hospital acquired infections and um, just reading the information, it says that you're exceeding the C. diff targets, which is great. Um, and I'm asking as a former clinical nurse educator who used to specifically teach central line infection and cannula related uh, best practice and management. So, and I'm looking at uh, Dr. Chris McKenna as somebody who might be able to help me. So I'm, ask, I'm going to say, what are the steps that the board are taking to ensure that NHS 5 produces the, the uh, hospital acquired infections, the staph aureus bacteremias, to achieve your rate of 0.24 per 1,000 acute occupied beds? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I think uh, we're taking a multi-professional approach um, to reducing uh, hospital acquired infection. So, um, as you said, uh, firstly, we're uh, um, one of the best hospitals in Scotland for the reduction in um, C. diff infections in NHS Fife, and that has been a fantastic achievement through multi-professional working, uh, working with our infection control colleagues um, and our microbiology team, good uh, antimicrobial stewardship, um, and so that has been a fantastic success for us. Um, uh, thinking about Staph aureus bacteremias, um, these remain a challenge for, for um, uh, uh, all health boards. We have a multi-professional vascular access group uh, looking at how we um, manage uh, vascular access devices within the organisation, how these are cared for and how these are documented. Um, and we have done um, uh, really focused pieces of improvement work in certain parts of the hospital where we recognise improvement was required. So within our cardiology unit and within our uh, renal um, uh, unit, um, such that those pieces of work are now looked upon nationally as, um, uh, as areas of excellence and for learning. Um, and by taking this approach of um, learning from um, these events in a systematic way, we're able to introduce um, stepwise improvements into our services uh, to ensure that we can reduce those infections. Uh, one of the innovative ways which we're able to do um, uh, ensure effective governance around the insertions of um, uh, peripheral um, cannulas is around the use of our electronic documentation for each of these devices. So NHS Fife is um, the only health board in Scotland that has patient track, which is our electronic um, fuse, we call it, which is the early warning score, uh, which is all documented on um, iPads and available to anybody at any point across the hospital. We now document the insertion of cannulas onto that system as well, which then has alerts and reminders such that medical and nursing staff know when these need to be reviewed and when these need to be changed. And that has led to significant improvements across our, um, our organisation. Um, Staph aureus bacteremias uh, re remain um, a, a, a large focus for us. Um, the challenge remains around community acquired infections. So these are infections with um, the Staph aureus 
um, bacterium that are brought into the hospital from um, patients from, um, out from the community. Um, and these are multifactorial, and thus the improvement plan around addressing these infections is much harder to, to implement. And these may be infections uh, with, um, so for patients with diabetes, um, fairly random skin infections, um, and then there is the other um, part of this, which is um, those uh, members of our community that inject drugs. And um, that remains a challenge for us, um, looking at how do we work with that um, group of patients to try and reduce their risk of infection. So um, working with our addiction services um, and to understand how we better influence that group of patients um, to reduce their risk. So we're, we've got a multi-faceted multi strategy to reducing hospital-acquired infection, but also going beyond that for SABs or Staph aureus bacteremias to how do we reduce that total rate. Just a quick sup. And Thanks. to peel apart, there's in-hospital infection, out-hospital infection, and then the community-acquired infections are necessarily not something that was caused by a healthcare professional causing a person to have their cannula or their line um, contaminated. So, so I suppose if we dug apart or peeled apart these numbers, we might be able to see that the hospital-acquired infections are not really hospital-acquired, that they might be patients coming from the community. Um, yes, yeah, so some of those um, infections will be patients who present to hospital with a condition, who are unwell, who subsequently turn out to have a, um, a, a Staph aureus bacteremia. But yes, that might not be hospital acquired or device acquired. It may be related to random infection or infection as a result of um, a, a pressure sore or a, 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 um, a, an ulcer or something like that that has gone into deep-seated infection. None, none of that explains why your performance is poorer than the Scottish average. So our performance uh, has improved significantly over um, the course of the last um, five years. Um, the total number uh, of Staph aureus bacteremias is higher than the Scottish average, but that is complicated by a higher number of patients who are coming into our organisation with infection. Um, but we do recognise that there is still work to be done with our hospital-acquired infection. We are working on that. Okay, Alex Briggs. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning um, to the panel. I wanted to um, focus on performance around mental health uh, waiting times, and specifically with regards to CAMS. Um, the current performance of NHS Fife is at 74.1% against uh, the national target. And I just wondered why performance um, has worsened over 2019. Thank you. I, I'll take that question. Uh, mental health uh, and CAMS is, is a function that's delegated uh, to the IGB. Uh, improving our performance in CAMS has been a real uh, priority for us over the, the last uh, number of years. Um, and uh, our performance in 1819 at 76% was uh, almost 10% higher than it was in 1718. Uh, uh, I, I checked. Uh, before we came this morning, the, the, the latest figures we have in terms of performance in March was at 80%. The figure it moves about uh, slightly, but we are pleased that overall the trajectory of the last couple of years has certainly been an improving uh, one, and that has been the result of a real focus on CAM's performance within the board and within the, the IGB, also of increased investment. We've increased the number of clinical sessions in the specialist CAMS service by 15 uh, sessions a week, particularly to target uh, the, those children and young people uh, with the, the longest uh, waits. The other significant uh, endeavour and development that we are uh, pursuing is thinking about a very broad-based uh, approach across all services, so working in partnership with uh, colleagues in Fife Council who are responsible for education, but also with the third sector as well. We've developed a, a strategy called our Minds Matter, which focuses on supporting children and young people 
at the very early stage, so in school, in the community, uh, where they're expressing distress or challenges around mental health uh, and well-being. And we believe we're seeing some uh, real results in that. We're investing in supporting the training of school guidance teachers and school nurses and, and other staff in schools uh, and in the community. We've also used uh, government resources uh, under the Action 15 uh, banner to invest in uh, primary mental health uh, workers uh, one in each of the, the seven kind of sub-localities in Fife that means as from uh, the 1st of April this year where a GP refers a children and young people uh, they will be seen uh, within uh, one uh, working uh, week and that primary mental health worker will either support the child or young person themselves, refer them on to a voluntary sector provision, or if it's required, of course, uh, make sure they're referred as quickly as possible uh, to specialist CAM services. But the advantage of that approach is, for the first time in many years, we are now seeing a slight reduction. It is only a slight reduction, but we're now seeing a slight reduction in the monthly referrals for CAM services because we believe we're supporting children and young people earlier in the kind of universal settings, but also in additional settings in the community as well. So it's been a real focus for us. Um, we, ha we have further to go. We're not at the target yet. Uh, but we believe we're, we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. I know um, some of the inquiry work we've done in the past have heard from parents uh, from Fife who have outlined their concerns about access to services, especially for um, children who are self-harming. That was one of the, the key um, part, uh, issues which were highlighted to us as a committee. I just wondered, in terms of um, measuring outcomes from mental health services, um, it sounds like you've already been undertaking some change in that area, but how do you measure outcomes um, as someone goes through the health service as well? So we need to track uh, those cases on an individual basis. You're right, the CAMS uh, target itself is an important target, but it's only one measure of the efficacy uh, of uh, the service. So uh, we, need to, uh, we need to look at um, uh, how uh, those services are, are supporting individual young people. And I know from, from speaking to the team, that's something that they take uh, very seriously. The other thing we do even within uh, specialist CAM services is make sure that people uh, in urgent, children, young people, sorry, in, in urgent need, need are, are seen uh, quickly, uh, uh, very quickly. So in, in urgent cases, the target is people are seen uh, within uh, two weeks and we endeavour to make sure that happens uh, where uh, at all uh, possible. So we do need to track uh, outcomes across the board and we do that, the team uh, does that, they, they seek uh, feedback from families uh, and carers uh, themselves. Um, we rec we rec recognise we have more to do on that, about capturing the views of, of the people we serve, both the children and young people uh, and their families, but that's a focus for the team uh, moving forward. Thank you, and, th and thinking about mental health in any organisation, um, one of the um, key questions I've been asking health boards as they've come in uh, to do this sort of MOT is what sort of culture they've built themselves for their staff around mental health. Now I know you um, have high sickness um, absence rates compared to other health boards so I just wondered in terms of mental health support for NHS staff and um, what's the current picture like in Fife? Thank you. Um, I think, as you'd expect, uh, looking at mental health, is, there's multi facets for our workforce in terms of looking at mental health support within the board as an employer. Um, so we're, we are undertaking a number of kind of work streams in relation to that. Um, obviously, one of our highest sickness uh, reasons is mental health uh, issues. Um, so as a board working in partnership, we have introduced an element of mental health training into our joint promoting attendance training that we do in partnership with our staff side representatives. We currently have our a Gold Healthy Working Lives Award. Part of that is assessing the support we give to our workforce in that area and we're looking to go beyond gold. We uh, secured investment in supplying mindfulness training and good conversation training for our staff. And one of the benefits we're getting from that, because we had very positive speed, uh, feedback from that, is that staff are actually looking to use that not just in the sense of the clinical placing in terms of their work or when they're at work, but actually also outside of work. So, uh, and the other thing we want to look at is see uh, if we can look to increase um, in any way we can the support we do give to our staff in terms of mental health issues. A lot of the mental health issues our staff experience from the work we've done with staff is that it's not work-related. It's actually can be related to life events outside of work. So again, we're looking to see how we can broaden potentially input um, from external um, support to again give our staff other options to allow them to remain at work. 
And we also have introduced um, a very quick referral system with to our occupational health service uh, and are uh, continuing to um, develop the awareness of our managers and also staff as colleagues, that if they see colleagues struggling, to also help them. So it's not just the managerial aspect, it's a colleague part as well. So we're looking in a really holistic way in mental health for our workforce, not just policies and practices, but beyond that. So we have, so we have a number of work streams uh, looking at that in partnership with our staff side colleagues within the board. Can I just have a, a final follow-up? You said there was external uh, support. What does that look like? Because I know in Lanarkshire, um, they're using a company who provide, like you've mentioned, assistance, not necessarily around mental health, but also around um, financial support. Um, if people have financial difficulties for lower paid NHS uh, staff. Um, do you already have that in place? And, and in terms of a very fast referral you, you referred to, what what is that? Is it next day or are we talking two weeks? Okay. Um, in terms of the, the fast referral, if I take that point first, um, because it's our internal occupational health service, if we have someone who is really needing an urgent appointment, we can arrange that internally with our occupational health staff. If they are not able to do that, we then look, we can uh, secure um, occupational health support from neighbouring boards. So it's that collaborative element with other boards as well if, they, if we are unable to meet that need. Um, and in terms of the support for staff with um, external support, we have a credit union in place. Um, and that was very successfully received, again, introduced in partnership with our staff side colleagues. Um, but we are also looking to see could we bring a uh, citizen advice on site to maybe give that support and begin to broaden the on site support for staff. We were at the very early stages of looking at that and what that may look like. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Brief supplementary, I'll call oh, no, I, I'd like to get into my directly. We'll, come back, we'll come back to you in, in okay. a moment. And just, just, just before we do that, um, I, I guess for Michael Kellett, the Primary Care Transformation Fund and the Primary Care Mental Health Fund have been established by the Scottish Government to assist in precisely these areas. Can you tell us how they've been used and what impact they have had or you expect them to have on demand for specialist mental health services? So I, I'll take each in turn, if that's OK, uh, convener. So in terms of the uh, Action 15 money, on, on uh, so the five share of the 800 uh, extra mental health workers across Scotland, uh, we've been... Uh, pursuing that uh, very uh, avidly and uh, I think we're on target to, to meet um, our share of, of those 800 workers. There's been a particular focus on supporting uh, children and young people, so the primary mental health workers I talked about uh, in terms of the, the answer to, to supporting the CAM service is part of that, but we're also uh, investing in uh, mental health uh, support for GP practices more generally for, for the, the wider uh, population. We're also thinking about how we can support A&E and ensure uh, that uh, people presenting at A&E uh, with mental health and mental health crisis can be supported. One example of that, we very recently opened um, a, a premise uh, working with um, Sam H and, and the voluntary sector in Fife called Sam's Cafe, which is a, 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 a cafe uh, that's open um, kind of twilight hours, 2 till 10 p.m. from Wednesday uh, through to uh, Sunday. That's a place where um, people in mental health distress can be taken. That's an alternative to them either being taken into police custody or being taken to A&E. And there's a peer-based uh, approach that's uh, working there. It's very early days. It's only been open a month or two, but we're seeing uh, good results there and, and it's been well uh, received. In terms of the primary care uh, improvement, uh, fund. Again, we're working hard with our uh, GP uh, practices across Fife uh, to agree uh, that uh, plan. We only last week at the, our IGB meeting on Friday, we agreed the plan for the primary care improvement uh, plan for year two uh, of the plan and what that investment will look like. Uh, we've made good progress, so we have invested, uh, for example, in a phlebotomy service for all GP practices across Fife. We think um, that we are the first uh, board and or IGB uh, in Scotland to have that comprehensive uh, phlebotomy uh, service uh, funded through the Primary Care Improvement Fund. We're also uh, uh, concentrating on pharmacotherapy so that pharmacy support for GP practice as well, supported uh, by the fund uh, as a priority. And uh, we're pleased with uh, with the, the progress uh, we've uh, made. Clearly, as, as more funding in terms of the primary care improvement that comes, comes year on year, we'll be able to invest in that multidisciplinary team approach surrounding GP practices more. Uh, but we've made good progress uh, and uh, we're, we're focused on maintaining that uh, progress as we move forward. 
quickly and, and briefly there are 90% targets for referral to treatment, both for child and adolescent mental health services and for psychological therapies. Where, where, Yes, indeed. When do you expect to be in a position to meet those targets? So, in terms of psychological therapies, that's that's more of a, a challenge for us than, than CAMS has been. It's not because we haven't focused on it, but our, our performance there uh, isn't uh, as good as it should be, and we recognise uh, the need to improve. On that front, we are redesigning uh, the service to meet uh, better the, the range of needs that prevent. We're making good progress in, in supporting uh, people with less complex needs through uh, group therapy through uh, community mental health teams and all through using uh, IT uh, support as well. Our particular focus moving forward is, is around how do we improve performance for adults with more complex uh, needs and that's been a real uh, focus for us. We're working closely with uh, a combined mental health access improvement team that ISD and Healthcare Improvement Scotland have in place. They're supporting us in terms of that, that redesign. In terms of our uh, trajectory, that's set out in the AOP. I think we're quite clear that uh, we make faster progress uh, in terms of CAMS uh, than we have in psychological therapies, but we're focused on, on, on making progress uh, in, relation to, in relation to both. Okay, thank you very much. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, Davina. Good morning, and uh, welcome to Trish Marwick. As, as uh, Anna Sarwar said, it's good to see you here on the other side of the fence, as it, as it may be as well. Could I just pick, pick up on, I think it was uh, Miles Briggs mentioned about the sickness and absence and what you had mentioned yourself. I mean, I know in 2017-18, it, it was, it was uh, worse than it is now, basically. And you have made slight improvements. But uh, Audit Scotland said there is a risk that sickness absence will remain at a high level and impact on staff morale, quality of care and the achievement to statutory performance targets. And then in evidence, in reply to Miles Briggs, you mentioned about uh, what actions you've been taking, like mindfulness, occupation, etc., etc. Do you have any other reasons of why there is a high standing uh, you know, absence, sickness and absence in your, your particular board? Thank you. As I say, I think there are a number of factors in respect of um, sickness absence um, because it is a bit like a jigsaw. There's a whole number of things that can contribute to that. So we really need to look across the, the whole piece. I mean, it can be a range of things from... Um, so we, we, we do look at our, and critically examine our short-term and long-term statistics. Our absence performance is discussed um, every month at our Area Partnership Forum, our Staff Governance Committee. So there really is quite a, a lot of discussion and scrutiny of our performance in that area. We actually have looked at doing a bit of a deep dive and a bit of work around looking at particular surveys in certain areas. So we have looked at discussing with our, um, our older workforce in terms of demography of our workforce, other specific issues that are contributing to that, um, regular kind of discussion with staff um, in terms of is there anything specific within certain areas. So we can look at our areas in terms of how we get our data. We can begin to see if there are particular hotspots and then that allows us to have a bit of a more specific discussion. Is it anything to do with the particular workforce, the work environment? So, but again, we have to look at kind of regularly across the piece. So it's very difficult to give that kind of one answer because I think there's a number of factors that do um, contribute. And I think within Fife, we have a, a, a good number of work streams that are being taken forward, as I said before, in partnership with staff side, who equally want to work with us to make sure that we make Fife, you know, the best place to work and actually um, look at how we can support people back to work quicker. We have a number of very supportive policies. Uh, we want to ensure they're being used absolutely to the full to allow staff to come back to work quicker in a, more, in a flexible way. And we've got lots of good examples of that. So I think the, answer, uh, the assurance I would give is to say that we, we look at it on a monthly basis. We look at it across the year when we get our end of year figures in. We know it remains a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge to um, quite a number of boards. And I think we have to really just keep that dialogue and discussion going in terms of getting to the bottom of what it is that we can do um, as the employer to assist staff to be supported to remain at work. Some of the things I've mentioned around mental health, early awareness, earlier support, um, colleagues looking towards staff and helping them as well. So there's a whole cultural aspect as well about supporting colleagues at work. So we are looking at everything, every element of it, to see what we can do to improve our performance actually in that area. We just started, a, and we're going to run a series of workshops where we're actually getting direct feedback from managers, from supervisors, from staff, about how it feels for them in terms of uh, promoting attendance, not just about application of the policy, but generally, what are the issues they want to feed back to us as the employer that they think would help. 
So again, that was very positively received, and we're looking to we will be running more of these, those throughout the year, along with everything else that we're doing in terms of multi generational work, in um, particular looking uh, particular uh, issues within certain areas. If we can support those, so there's really a whole a huge number of things actually happening to allow us to get to the bottom of, of that. But I think I do think we have very positive issues. As I said, the mindfulness training, good conversation, um, that is really beginning uh, to have an impact in terms of staff understanding just what that looks like, how it helps them have conversations with staff who may be having difficulty or may be experiencing problems, even if they're not within work. So I think we are running a number of uh, very different work strands um, to try and get to the bottom and to try and improve our performance. Chair, thank you. Is there anything even as simple as transport? Which uh, I mean, I had a meeting with the uh, staff at Glasgow Royal Infirmary uh, just the other day, and transport is a huge issue, uh, particularly parking and parking charges as well. Is, is that something as well that would people are absent, whatever it may be, transport issues, trying to get into work or, or leaving late or working at weekends? It may be. It may actually be that. But that's what I'm saying. We need to look beyond the issues that are just within the workplace and the work environment that we can control. Um, because some of, it, some of it may be that, or it may be temporary impact on staff that's happening because of something that's happening in their family life that we, we might be able to be flexible and help them. So I think you're right, there are a number of other things that um, may not be directly related to the workplace or, or the environment we provide. But I couldn't say that that, you know, I think it could be. It may be financial issues, um, uh, financial issues within the family, there can be a number of things, illness within the family. But again, there are some of our policies we can use to help staff in that situation. But we do want to have the discussion which is broader than that and say we can provide a, a broad support, maybe out and out with work related things that we can help staff. Can I ask a couple other questions? Sorry, uh, when you mentioned the fact conversations, is basically are the staff consulted? Do they do a tick box exercise? I mean, how do you have the conversation with the staff in regards to, <coughs> excuse me, why either they can't get to work or why the sickness or the absence? Is it a tick box exercise in that respect? Um I would, uh, well, I would hope it, uh, it's not a tick box. And I think, you know, so I think there are a number of ways that that conversation happens with staff. So yes, you can have a very formal conversation with a member of staff when they return to work as part of the policy. And that shouldn't just be about the return to work in terms of the absence. It does give the opportunity for broader discussion around other things they may want to raise. Out with that, normal management conversations that are happening um, with staff um, also would give the ability the ability and the um, opportunity to have those discussions. Um, I think that's where the good converse conversation training that we actually ran uh, last year and we're looking to continue this year, um, because some of those topics are quite sensitive for staff to come forward and speak speak about. So that good conversation training is actually equipping people to have those conversations in a very sensitive and supportive way. So we'd hope that the kind of normal management relationships that people have, or even with colleagues with and colleagues they work with to then be confident in actually raising those those issues. To, to the the nub the nub of that particular one is uh, what financial cost is it to the board in regards to uh, <laughs> sickness and absence? Do you take that into account? Um, on terms of the, in terms of the reports that go to. Um, uh, that we provide in terms of absence, we are able to look at what that, that means in terms of a financial figure. It is one that has to be taken with a health warning because getting the true cost of absence, and I think my direct finance would agree, there are a number of factors that you have to watch how you calculate that. Um, so, but for us, yes, there is a cost aspect and, and, and actually lost productivity. But I think the more important one is about how do we help our staff actually stay at work and support them at work so that they aren't off or get them actually back quicker. Um, but we have to recognise the fact it does have an impact, but it's that part about how do we support our staff to be at work, to be off for a shorter period of time, to get them back quicker, and to, to be in a situation where they may not need to go off at all if we're able to intervene uh, quicker. Yeah. More broadly, there's a, I was very concerning to see the fall in participation in the staff survey in iMatter. I think Fife is now so low that you don't have any official returns for last year. Uh, do you, is there a reason why that's arisen? 
Um, I think that um, with if the iMatter uh, uh, tool that you're talking about, convener, um, I think it, uh, there is research that shows that actually iMatter, once you're into your second and third cycle, there can be a drop. Um, I'm kind of pleased to report that certainly the iMatter cycle we're in just now, um, we have uh, increased our petition level in that, and the board will receive an actual board report which will allow us to look at the issues that iMatter covers and be able to develop an action plan in respect of that. I think I, with that, though, also to give the committee an assurance that in the year where there was no report, that didn't mean that we didn't have the ability to consider the issues of why we didn't have a report to ensure that those were picked up on as well. So although there was no board report, it's to, we still, as a board, considered, OK, really what you're saying, why did that happen? But also that encouragement to managers to have that engagement, to re-energise that engagement with staff, and that's been proven in the recent, um, the recent return that the reports are just out this week. OK, thank you. Did you have one more Sorry. point? Well, it was actually about the dementia referrals. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Is, that, Please do. Is yeah. that OK if I can come in on that particular yeah. one as well? <clears throat> Basically, um, it's one, an area that interests myself, uh, the dementia referrals. And basically, you know, obviously there's information with the social care partnership in regards to the, the referrals and the patients waiting for contact for a link worker uh, kind of rose sharply in the last quarter of 2018. So I just wondered, you know, if you can explain uh, absolutely the number of patients waiting for contact uh, for a dementia worker and why it rose so sharply in 2018. Um, what's the current situation uh, in relation to waiting lists for dementia post and diagnostic support? Thank you. I, I'll deal with that. The, that particular uh, figure that, that you've um, talked about, it's something that came up at our, the IGB's Finance and Performance Committee uh, just last week, uh, and we had some uh, detailed discussion about it. We're not sure that figure uh, is, is, is accurate. We think um, it it's, could be about recording uh, around that uh, increase in, in weights in terms of uh, referrals for uh, post-diagnostic support and contact with a link worker. And it's something coming out of that discussion with the Financial Performance Committee we agreed to look at with a, a matter of uh, urgency. It's not been a, an area of challenge for us in the past and we don't really understand why it is now. So we're, we're seeking to get, understand, to get uh, underneath that. Dementia is a real focus for us in Fife, both in terms of uh, that it targets around post-diagnostic support, but also in terms of uh, we have a, a, a broad campaign, I would describe it, around uh, making Fife a dementia-friendly uh, community. We are the first dementia-friendly community in Glenrothes, and uh, we are uh, investing and supporting other communities uh, to come on uh, board. And I was at, at, at an event only in the last couple of weeks where we recognise that, that somewhere around 150 businesses and organisations across Fife, everything from chip shops to bowling clubs and, and commercial, big commercial businesses, supermarkets and others in between, have put their staff through dementia-friendly training. Uh, and uh, we also have over 4,000 individuals who've, who've gone through that training too. So dementia is a real uh, focus for us, both in terms of making building awareness of dementia, tackling the stigma around it, but also ensuring that uh, those individuals and their families who uh, are do it, diagnosed uh, get that support. I'd be very happy to write to the, the member if that would be helpful around uh, when we have that detailed understanding of that figure, uh, because at, at the moment we're not convinced it's, it's accurate. Well, 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 thank you, thank you so uh, if you would, if you would write to the committee with that course, information, that would be, that'd be helpful. Uh, Alec Hampton. Thank you. Good to the panel. Obviously, welcome to the Right Honourable Trisha Marwick. Good to see you again. Um, I'd like to take the discussion back to uh, organisational health and staff morale. And uh, one of the determinants of staff morale is uh, how staff feel supported, how safe they feel, and how they feel their concerns will be dealt with if they're, they're raised. So can I ask, um, how many whistleblowing complaints are NHS 5 currently dealing with? So of the, this current current year, um, we have uh, received um, one identifiable um, whistleblowing that has come in to the level of the uh, board and uh, the, the chief executive uh, of the board. Um, in terms of um, whistleblowing uh, throughout the organisation, um, we are currently looking at how we can um, strengthen how we, we get that data. But any that are whistleblowing that received um, tend to get escalated so that we know about them. Um, but we have one formal at the moment in terms of 1920. Low for being the second biggest territorial health board in the country, or one of the, not the second, but one of the biggest. Um, is, how does that compare to previous years? 
Um, in previous years, I think we, in terms of um, last year, we had a f we had five. Um, so, and the, that data is provided through the our collation of the data, but also we obviously have the the national reporting line that was set up for NHS Scotland, and uh, that provider has now changed. But in the previous year's reports from the previous provider, our reports always sat at zero to three. So that could be anything from not receiving any, which was zero to three, because we never got the detail uh, behind that. So it always has been low in terms of the collation of the data. Um, so from the previous formal um, collation, not to, not to three, we had one year, as I say, um, we received more than that. And then this year, in terms of being dealt with, we have one formally being dealt with. OK, thank you. Um, can I move to the organisational health at the top of the organisation? You've had quite a lot of churn in the last sort of 12 to 18 months in terms of board members and members, senior members of staff, members of senior management. Um, can I ask, um, Scott McLean, for example, was your former chief operating officer left last summer. It was not entirely clear why. Can I ask what were the reasons for his departure? The reason for his departure is that he resigned from the board. On, on what grounds? What precipitated his decision to resign? Um, he made a decision he wished to resign and take up another post somewhere else. OK. Um, some of the sort of background noise around the churn at the top of the organisation has led to suggestions of bullying in the organisation. How would you respond to those? I, I don't believe there's bullying in the organisation. I think that when we hear of any issues around bullying, we clearly deal with it immediately um, and we investigate it. And if that comes through whistleblowing or it comes through the normal way of, of managers working through things, then, then we pick it up and, and we'll deal with it through the HR channels and what other systems there. And we will work in partnership also to work through that as well. But in the staff at every level in the organisation, if they felt bullied or sidelined or marginalised, um, that, that they would know who to speak to um, within the organisation. Because it can be quite difficult if they feel that um, they're not being listened to at the top of the organisation, they don't have faith in the organisation's leadership, um, that who, who do they raise those concerns with? Well, I, I believe we've done significant work with individuals to understand their line manager is a key person to go to. And if the line manager is obviously a problem within that, they've got other people they can go to as well. And I think we do that in partnership with the um, staff side in terms of making sure that information is freely available. And we have very open conversations with staff side about how we can support staff in those issue, with those issues. Anybody else in the panel? No, I was just, I was just going to when you talk about a churn of senior staff, in actual fact, you're right. I mean, we have lost a number of senior staff recently, most of whom have retired. Um, and we have recruited in their stead um, equally wonderful people. So we've got a new um, director of public health. We've got a very new um, medical director. Um, you know, that is part of the churn. Um, our... Um, senior staff um, are part of that churn and we are recruiting. And in terms of directors within the board itself, you seem to be have more churn than other health boards. Is that just I think happenstance? Or? I, I, I think partly um, it's an age profile. I mean, you know, we've had uh, two uh, senior members who of the board who have retired, Paul, anything like that? Today? Yeah, and, and being a medium-sized board, there's always opportunities in bigger tertiary boards or other things as well that directors want to do. I think directors get to um, director level at an early, earlier age now and want to have more of a portfolio career and want to look at different things to do. Um, you know, Chris, no disrespect, is, is a very young medical director uh, and may want to do other things in his career you know, before he retires at some point. So you know, I, I think we're in a different world of much mo more mobile uh, directorships that are going on across Scotland, across the UK. I mean, one of our um, member, uh, a director of performance, uh, left us, very sadly. She is now the chief executive of the Golden Jubilee. Um, so you know, that's the point that Paul's making. There are opportunities that come up. Um, and part of our role um, as uh, leaders of the organisation is to make sure that we give the support, we give the mentoring, and we give the confidence for people who, if they wish to take up other positions, then you know they go with our good wishes. Um, and we would hope that we can entice them back at some point in the future. Um, but you know you can't stop. You know uh, Scotland is a small place. Fife is relatively um, a small. Uh, board area um, so when there's opportunities then people will go um, but we also have had an age profile um, 
that has led to two senior directors retiring. OK, thank you. Can I just follow up with one top on a completely different issue? Um, and that is, you, your waiting times for urology are some of the highest in the country. Um, for what reason is that? We, we've had problems recruiting urologists. Uh, we work very closely on our cancer work um, using the robot with um, Lothian. Um, we've managed to recruit um, a new urologist that's coming through now, so it's one of our critical areas in terms of pressure on the system. And it's a national one as well. So we're looking at ways of different uh, ways of dealing with some of the urology patients. And uh, we're very lucky to have one of our urologists that's um, working um, and pulled forward something called Eurolift, which is a different way of dealing with patients with um, prostate issues that are precancerous, um, which means we can do those works in a treatment room. So we can actually get some of the more bigger operations through the system whereas we're not using theatres and lengths of stay and beds to do that with. So we're trying to innovate at the same time as trying to recruit. Ultimately, uh, the strategy around that is to link up with Tayside and with um, Lothian and have shared sessions so that we have consultants working in both so that we can recruit some of the higher level work that can be done in Lothian and see some of the district general work that we're doing as well as, as a part of that plan. Do you have a sort of time window for how you expect to see improvement roll out? Well, I'm hoping by the end of the year we'll be able to recruit some more urologists by doing that practice with Lothian. But sometimes what you end up with is, is a churn of somebody retiring simultaneously as you manage to recruit someone. But urology is one of our key areas, as it is in Lothian as well, and we're working with them. Okay. Uh, I think in terms of recruitment, um, the board has been quite innovative in trying to recruit um, specialists and our nurses. Um, and, you know, we have been very successful where we have um, had boards and recruiting. Um, we are over recruiting at the moment. Um, so that if we get people who are above the line, um, then they will all be offered a job. Um, and that means that, you know, we will make sure they have a job so that when a vacancy comes up, um, we're not having to recruit again. Um, in terms of um, recruiting, in terms of nursing, um, you know, Barbara has done, and Helen, our, our nurse director, who's not here, has done a fantastic job in uh, recruiting uh, nurses. Have you got figures for that, Barbara? We're talking about um, within this year, there'll be over 200 nurses actually recruited into NHS Fife, um, which is at, which at a time when we are challenging with other boards round about us because we're all facing workforce challenges is actually um, really impressive. And that is through the very proactive work that uh, my nurse director and our colleagues do with the universities. Um, and they have also successfully had discussion on reintroducing training and placements within Fife for specialties like mental health, which previously hadn't been the case. So there's a lot of positive work happening in Fife in terms of nurse recruitment. Was it, was it, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to add to the urology conversation because I think that um, it's important we recognise that the pathway for management of urology cancers, um, in particular prostate, has changed and is significantly more complex and cross, as a result of that, cross health board. So um, not all of the treatments that would be delivered for one patient um, would be all be delivered in five. So part of the pathway would be in five and part of the pathway may be in Lothian. And that's where complexities around waiting times do arise. Um, one of the things that Fife does fantastically around the urology pathway is access to MRI um, imaging. And we have one of the, um, the best, um, in spite of our challenges around radiology, have one of the best um, access to MRI scans and reporting of the scan um, in Scotland. So it is a complex issue, but as Paul says, we are um, working with uh, our local team, but also the, the uh, multi-professional team across um, Fife and Lothian to help improve and streamline that pathway um, and I think it is a work in progress. Thanks. Paul do you want to... Or are you yeah. so so, so, so in, in terms of over-recruiting, it does sound a little mad, but, but it's actually not, because as we over-recruit, we actually have uh, minimised some of the agency use and bank use of some consultant staff, because as the churn happens, we have somebody to walk into that post. That improves quality, it reduces cost, and also gives a sense of the organisation <laughs> that we're listening to them with the pressures that are in the system at the same time. Brian Whittle. Good morning uh, to the panel. Um, my interest lies around the integration of uh, health and social, social care, and I notice from uh, the revenue budget 2019-20, I think the convener 
already alluded to that there is a net budget gap uh, predicted of just north of uh, six and a half million. So I wonder uh, if you could uh, start off by just uh, telling us how you would intend to close uh, that projected gap. Thank you, uh, Convener. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, as I said, this is a, a real uh, focus for us. Um, one of the things uh, we've recognised that, that we need to do is plan both for the short term uh, and for the long term. Um, and we are doing that in partnership with our partners. So we had uh, the first of uh, a number of sessions uh, earlier uh, last week with the, a broad based uh, management team across the Health and Social Care Partnership. With, with a dual focus, first of all, about how do we bear down on the, the, the £6.5 million uh, overspend in the, the budget for this year? How can we um, take out more efficiencies? How can we uh, cut cloth to make sure uh, we uh, deliver on that but, but push it down? But also, how can we, we look to the uh, longer term, recognising that in terms of longer term, that means redesign, that um, we won't achieve uh, financial balance uh, through uh, efficiencies, we need to kind of redesign our services and change how we deliver them. We need to have a, a real emphasis on early intervention and prevention, and we've begun to do that, but recognise we need to do more there. We need to support people uh, to support themselves, to, to be supported in their uh, communities and the work we're doing in localities. In Fife, we have a network of wells, a, a new one-stop shop for uh, support for uh, people in need in terms of health and, and social care, a network of those wells uh, right across Fife. So that's that's the approach. We're, we're taking focused action, but we're also uh, investing in early intervention and prevention, recognising that if we don't change the shape of our services, the, our, our uh, ambition to deliver financial sustainability is going to be very hard to reach. Okay. Jason, just on, just on that point there, uh, I mean, there is... I know there's an underspend, I think, again, uh, that had already been mentioned in the sort of community services. Um, and you talked there about the sort of early intervention and, and prevention, which would suggest uh, that, that, that this shift towards community is where that, 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 uh, most of that redesign is likely to be. So can you explain the sort of underspend in the, the sort of community services and how we're going to address that? So, thank you. Happy to do that. So the, the, the significant underspend we had last year was around our community health care budget. I think the underspend was just uh, north of, of four million pounds and, and that's really around largely around vacancies uh, around uh, community uh, nursing and in uh, general services general dental services sorry and also in administrative support so that that's a, a, an underspend in the community health care uh, budget uh, and uh, that's something that that we will uh, keep a, an eye on clearly we don't want the position of not having community uh, nursing uh, posts uh, Posts uh, filled, uh, but the, the 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 new developments in that kind of preventative space I, I talked about are around supporting people before uh, they uh, need or require statutory services. So that's about how can we connect people with third sector organisations, help them to support themselves, and the network of wells is is beginning uh, to do that. And we've seen uh, quite in innovative uh, practice around how we are. Uh, supporting people to, to, to support themselves. There's a really active uh, well uh, in Kirkcaldy, in the town centre there, that's open uh, for a number of hours a week, and they've uh, doing innovative things about supporting individuals who are isolated to come together uh, around the, the, the uh, local costa that's uh, across the way in the town centre. So really kind of innovative means of connecting people who would otherwise be isolated and, and trying to build support uh, in those uh, creative ways. So uh, that's, 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 what, why, how we're, that's one example of how we're trying to ensure we're, we're in that uh, preventative space. Just... Uh, Push a little further on the prevention. Where, where are you in terms of adoption of technology? Uh, I would imagine that the shift towards, again, uh, from, from uh, secondary to primary care and into community, technology would play a big part in that. So where are we in terms of that, that sort of adoption? It does, and, and we make a, 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 a lots of use of technology. So we have a, a, a very extensive network of uh, community alarms across uh, Fife, uh, and uh, we also have uh, telehealth, tele uh, care uh, that support a, a, a large number of individuals. It's an area of focus for us. Uh, we are just in the process uh, of revising the strategic plan for the Health and Social Care Partnership. And one of the priorities we identify in that is we need to really 
uh, take a step change around our, our use of technology so we can uh, deliver uh, services uh, differently. There are, uh, there's, there's innovation happening. Uh, Snap 40, which is a, a device that can monitor uh, people's vital signs effectively, uh, is being piloted within our hospital at home uh, service at the moment. And we're, we're also looking at, at other examples at the moment of uh, working with a company who have developed an app uh, that supports and prompts people to take medicines. So people who are, who are living at home who need a reminder to take uh, medicines. So there's a number of approaches here, but one of the things we said in the strategic plan is we need to focus uh, on improving the, that digital uh, agenda. And we're working with the kind of e-health and ITA uh, leads in both Fife Council and in NHS Fife to help us on, on that agenda. So we're doing a lot, but there's certainly more to do on that digital front. I just uh, could, uh, uh, Convener, I just wanted to, to, to give you the opportunity to, to respond to uh, Audit Scotland, who are suggesting perhaps that um, health and social care arrangements in Fife are not operating as effectively as they possibly could. And I think one of the interesting things they, they note here is that, uh, and I quote here, that staff and members are sometimes predisposed towards the interests of employing organisation rather than the partnership. And I don't think that is, that is an unusual position that we've heard uh, across other uh, uh, IJBs. So I just wondered if I'd give you the opportunity to, to reply to that and, and, and let us know how far along that... that uh, Real integrated. Can I just say on behalf? Can I thanks, Kavina. Can I just say on behalf of um, the health board and me personally, um, we have got six members, eight members um, from the health board on the health and social care partnership. Um, the health board does not tell them what to do. Um, the legislation is quite clear um, that while they may be members of the health board, uh, they are there in their own right. And they do not ever go with a mandate from the health board to the IGB. Um, they uh, know, of course, about what the issues are. Um, and they have got to make up their own mind and make their own decisions about them. Um, but there's certainly no pressure from either me or the health board for a particular outcome. Thank you. I just did. Sorry, thanks. Just to, to build on what uh, Trisha said, I suppose from, from my perspective, I see a, a group of, there's obviously eight multi voting members uh, from the, on the IGB from the, the Health Board and eight uh, councillors uh, from Fife Council. What I see is a, a, an increasing willingness and, and understanding for, th for those uh, members to come together to understand issues in a, in a kind of private space, to spend time together, identifying what the, the key issues are for the, the partnership. The ministerial uh, steering group review its recommendations and the self-assessment we had to do in Fife, I think was quite helpful in, in allowing us to come together across the system to, to look at, at the priorities. Interestingly, we, we brought uh, those 16 voting members together informally last week at, at their suggestion and, and the suggestion uh, of the chair and, and vice chair of the IGB to... Um, to develop that that sense of of, of togetherness and, and and shared endeavour, and certainly from my perspective, that feels like uh, it's 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 making progress. And, and I know both the chair and vice chair of the IGB are, are determined that 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 approach uh, will continue, uh, and that they'll continue to build that culture, recognising that from both uh, bodies um, that. Uh, the voting members in IGB are clearly aware of, of the pressures on their their kind of constituent uh, organisations, but also that they they need to come together uh, in terms of making decisions that are in the best interests uh, of the the people of Fife when they're around the IGB table. And I certainly personally uh, think uh, that uh, we're making good progress in that regard. Before before I bring in Paul Hawkins, can I take it from the contributions of both Tricia Marwick and Michael Kelly that you accept? the view of Audit Scotland that more needs to be done in this field? I, think, I, I certainly would accept the view of Audit Scotland. Um, and you know, the view of Audit Scotland is reflected alongside the IGB table. I mean, I get it from um, the um, members of the health board who are on the IGB. Everybody recognises that there needs to be more work done. It's a pretty new organisation. It's only three years old. Um, what has got to happen is that the two cultures of the council and the health board have got to be 
melded together. Um, and I think it's fair to say they're probably not there yet. But what I have seen, as Michael says, um, that there has been progress made. And I think there is a great willingness um, to try to work the best that they can uh, for the good of the people of Fife. Michael Kelly, do you want to add anything? No, just to agree with what Tricia says. I, I think it's fair to say that there's more to do. I think everybody around the IGB table would recognise that, but I think progress has been made. Paul Hawkins. I think really just to confirm what the Chairman said, it's a three-year-old organisation, which I think has shown maturity, but needs to further mature in terms of understanding exactly what it's there for and how we move forward in some of the deliverables at speed now, which is needed in terms of where we are with some of the finances as well. But I, I think there's a good future coming. I think putting House and the Council together is the only way forward. It's how we make it work and, you know, continual changes in different people that are on the IJB as politicians move and non-execs uh, change. Um, it's about keeping that brand and that process of how we move forward with integration. Chris McKenna. Um, really just to echo, I guess as the only voting member on the IGB sitting here today, um, uh, and as a new member to that group, I think that there is extreme willingness to learn and to... Um, and to grow together um, uh, and develop those relationships, that's what I f have found. So I think that's a reassuring thing. I think the, 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 there are difficult aspects to bringing the governance aspects of care and the governance aspects of health together in one place, and I can see the challenges that that um, does bring with it. But, but actually, there's a willingness around the table to manage those in a really professional um, and um, productive way. So I, I think th that's a, a positive thing. Yeah. Yes, please. A, a, a slight wee bit there. Um, we're fortunate in Fife um, that we've got one council and we've got one health board um, and we've got one IGB. That is not the situation in most parts of the country where they've got five, six IGBs um, per council. Um, so we're in a really, really lucky position. Um, but with that comes responsibility. Um, because we um, want to make it work. We know it can work. Um, because if it doesn't work in Fife, with all the advantages we've got, then it's not going to work anywhere else. And I think everybody is absolutely committed in Fife, whether it be the health board or whether it be the council um, and the people who are in the IJB, to make sure that it works for the benefit of the people of Fife. Um, and Paul is right. I mean, you know, the um, bringing together of certain aspects of uh, the health board and certain aspects of the council is the right thing to do. Um, and we need to make sure that the transformational change that we all recognise needs to happen, um, happens now apace. Um, but it's important that we take people with us. Um, and, you know, if there has been problems. It is about the two different cultures. And I think as the organisation itself is bedding down, then I think the problems will be lessened. Thanks for that. It's an interesting perspective. Clearly, some of what we're hearing today are things we've heard from other IGBs and health boards earlier in the process. And it does seem to me that despite the co-terminosity, you are behind the uh, pace in some ways in achieving that change, so I'm sure that's something we'll reflect upon going forward. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, everybody. Um, increase in delayed ju discharges, can you explain why this has happened and what measures IJ IJB is putting in place to sustain improvements in this area? I'll take that, um, Mr Torrance, if that's OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, delayed discharge remains a, a real focus for us in the Health and Social Care Partnership working very closely alongside uh, colleagues in the acute hospital. You're right that the figures most recently have increased, but if you look at the position over the last few years, we have succeeded in reducing the overall uh, numbers of delayed discharge in the, in the system, as well as the numbers in, in, in long uh, delay. However, as I've said, challenges remain. The, uh, the total delays in our, our system because I, I thought that this would, issue would come up. I, I looked and, and were 68 yesterday, higher than we would like them to be, but an improvement on the position we saw over winter. Uh, the way we tackle delays is, is multifaceted. We have a, a discharge hub located in the Victoria Hostel in Kirkcaldy. Uh, that's uh, run by 
a team uh, that, that I have responsibility for of, of the health and social care partnership, but that's a multi-professional team with social workers, health staff and, and others whose daily focus is on uh, working with the acute hospital to ensure we have flow uh, across uh, the system, both ensuring um, discharges to, to social care uh, for those uh, people, but also uh, that we uh, can discharge people efficiently from uh, the acute hospital to one of our community hospitals uh, where that's uh, clinically required uh, for them. The Discharge Hub has, has, has evolved uh, over time. We see it as, as being a real source of strength and innovation. Uh, we've worked uh, with Shelter in terms of how we support homeless people uh, that come into uh, the, the hospital system. We've also got a particular project around how we support military veterans and support them working with the Defence Medical Workforce uh, service uh, and uh, so it will remain a, a constant focus for us but it's a, it's a joint endeavour between ourselves and acute colleagues it's something we focus on daily senior managers are involved in a, a weekly meeting uh, in terms of performance and we have a system of escalation uh, as well to bring things to my attention and ultimately pause if that's required if delays are uh, not uh, moving in in the right direction so we, we've made significant progress uh, but uh, we recognise that there's, there's always uh, more to do. David Torrance. The current level of uh, delayed discharge, how much is that costing? In terms of those uh, 60 beds, I, I don't have a figure for that uh, immediately uh, to hand. Uh, I'm sorry to say we can certainly uh, get that. We do know, uh, and I, I had uh, figures uh, in terms of the, the number of uh, bed days uh, lost uh, in the year 1718, the, the, the Scottish average uh, was that 7.8% uh, uh, bed days were lost because of delayed uh, discharge. The five figure was 7.5%, so just below uh, that uh, Scottish average. But in terms of costs, I don't have that figure immediately to hand. I can certainly supply that. Um, we've heard, the committee's heard in previous evidence um, that the supply of care home and care home places um, have affected delayed discharge. What actions are you putting in place to try and alleviate this problem? So the the availability of care home places isn't a significant challenge for us in, in Fife. We have approximately 3,000 care home beds across uh, the kingdom. Um, about 10% of those are, are in council-owned uh, care homes. Um, thankfully, our, our, our trajectory is that we are making less use of uh, residential uh, care than we have previously and that is in line with our ambition to support me more people at home uh, or close to home. The biggest challenge we face in terms of uh, dealing with delays is our care at home capacity, so our capacity both in our in-house service and third and, and independent providers to support uh, people with home care in their uh, own homes. So that's something we're, we're working on. Uh, we've innovated in that regard. We introduced uh, a system called Total Mobile, first of all, in their in-house service uh, that made uh, scheduling uh, much more uh, efficient uh, so we can make sure we're we are running an efficient service as possible. That service is, is, is now being extended to the independent and, and voluntary sector and we expect to see uh, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, improvements in performance uh, there as well. We also work closely uh, with the providers to encourage them uh, to develop uh, their services. Uh, th we have 27 providers of care at home services in the independent or, or private sector that we work with in Fife. And I have a team who lays with them very closely about um, improving their capacity to, to meet the, the market needs. We have challenges in particular areas that you might imagine we have challenges recruiting care at home staff in North East Fife. Interesting at the moment, we have a particular challenge around the Cowdenbeath area as well. But again, we're working with providers to try to encourage, uh, bring more uh, provision to market so we can meet uh, those needs uh, as quickly as we can. David, did you have any further questions? Um, different subject. Yes, please. Um, out, out, out of care services in Fife, um, can you update the committee on the redesign of them? Again, I think, um, I, and I, 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 as uh, Mr. Torrance knows, I, well, I, th I think he, he will know, uh, the IGB was uh, debating uh, this issue at its meeting of Friday of last week, and I, I'm pleased to confirm that uh, the IGP took what was a difficult decision to approve a new clinical model of out-of-hours GP 
uh, care, and it did so uh, last week on the basis of unequivocal clinical advice that that was the, the right thing to do. So the new uh, model that we'll begin to implement, our plan is to have that in place uh, before uh, this winter, is a uh, out of our service with three centres, uh, one in Kirkcaldy at the Victoria Hospital, one in Dunfermline at the Queen Margaret Hospital, and another uh, in St Andrews in the St Andrews uh, Community Hospital. The, the service in uh, Dunfermline and Kirkcaldy will be open uh, 118 hours a week, so, so at all points when GP services aren't, the St Andrews model will be uh, more flexible. Uh, focusing on when there's uh, greatest uh, demand at the weekends and evenings. And that service will also be supplemented by increased capacity around uh, home visiting. So when people clinically acquire a, a GP uh, or a practitioner visit out of hours, that there'll be more capacity to do that. The other thing the IGB approved on Friday was uh, a new transport policy to support the out-of-hour service. So for those uh, few individuals who uh, can't, uh, travel to a centre where that's clinically the right place for them to be seen. Um, uh, we know that, for example, 94% of people who access uh, centres out of hours do so are either driven by themselves or are, are driven by a family or friend. But for that small number who can't, we've, we've now approved a policy where they can be uh, supplied uh, with uh, a taxi, and that was part of the decision uh, making uh, as uh, well. The other thing we've done around out of hours, which is uh, prompted by the challenges we faced uh, around sustaining the existing model. And Mr Torrance will know and the committee may know that we're in a, a contingency a arrangement at, at, at the moment, is we've had real innovation about bringing a multidisciplinary team to our out-of-hours GP service. So we now have specialist paramedics working as part of the service. We have uh, a, a number now of advanced uh, nurse practitioners. We're also uh, introducing recruiting healthcare support workers, so that multidisciplinary team around uh, the uh, GP is who work in out-of-hours is bringing kind of real innovation and uh, it allows us to be confident that the new model that the IGB approved will be sustainable uh, in, the, in the longer term. Um, so happy to take any further questions, but hopefully that's a, a useful update. Thank you very much. Miles, please. Thank you. Uh, convener, as a follow-on, actually, to David Torrance's question, because I know looking at the statistics, NHS 5 has seen the highest percentage increase in emergency admissions of all NHS boards. Do you put that down to the fact that you've seen problems with uh, out-of-hours, and specifically um, not renewing the out-of-hours service around Glenrothes? What work will go on there to see that patients aren't being admitted when they don't necessarily need to be? Well, I will start, and, and Paul. So, uh, in terms of uh, Glenrothes, we uh, we've kept a very close eye on the performance. The the, the service is currently called PCS, the Primary Care Emergency Service, uh, and uh, we have kept very close eye on its performance and the number of people it sees since the contingency arrangement has been in place since April of last year. And we haven't seen a, a significant change in terms of... So the contingency arrangement only applies for the overnight hours from 12 midnight till 8 a.m. We've been keeping a very close eye on the number of people that the service sees in that period, uh, and, and we know it's, it's remained uh, very largely the same uh, over uh, time. Um, so we don't think that's a factor. In terms of the Glenrothes, there, there has been concern from, from the Glenrothes community, and we worked hard with them to explain... Uh, the, the new arrangement to explain the, the, the transport policy because one of the uh, concerns that uh, MSP and MP colleagues uh, 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 had throughout this process is that point about if somebody ha doesn't have access to a car, how are they going to get to centre? Uh, and so we think the transport policy is important in ensuring we can get people seen in the right place at the uh, right time. So that's something we keep a close eye on. Paul may want to say more about the, 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 the rate of emergency uh, attendances at a &E. So, so um, over the last three months, we've seen uh, more than 20% rise in Fife. I've talked to other chief execs, and they've seen roughly the same thing coming through their A&Es. Um, obviously, that's a negative thing. We need to deal with that. Um, prior to that, we were doing an analysis to look at whether PCES was a contributing factor in that sort of pie chart of number of people, and we couldn't see it was significantly changing that. The only positive thing from that is that our conversion to admission has not moved. So even though we're seeing 20% more, we're not admitting 
a percentage more is staying exactly the same. So we're analysing that at the moment and working together to try and work out what's going on and the chief execs across Scotland are doing the same. I understand in the UK it moved exactly the same right across. So it, it, it's about understanding that in its wider form, I think. And what plans do you have around that? I know here in Lothian, um, uh, where we've also seen, you know, increased admissions, we're looking towards minor injuries units being established. Are you looking to provide that locally as well? So we have minor injuries at Queen Margaret Hospital in Dunfermline, and what we're doing is trying to signpost people to use that more actively to, to make sure that service is robust and provides another opportunity for a faster service at the same time. So we are doing that signposting. The best signposting at all, though, really is to talk about using pharmacy and the wider aspects rather than attending the A&E. And how do you think the GP contracts also in, impacted on this? Turn to Microsoft. We, I, so it's, I suppose it's early days in terms of the GP contract. We hope that GP contact will be a really positive uh, 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 endeavour uh, and, and programme in the sense that it will support uh, GP services during the day to be more uh, sustainable by building that multidisciplinary team uh, around them. And that should help um, support people across the whole system and, and obviously should help uh, dealing with uh, people who, who uh, might go to A&E if, they, if they, they feel they can't be seen Quickly, quickly within the, the local uh, GP services. So, so we certainly think uh, it should be a positive uh, factor uh, in this regard. But as Paul says, we need to uh, do a piece of work to understand what's happening right across the system in terms of the, the volume of attendances that Paul's talked about. The one thing I think the decision on Out of Hours gives us is an opportunity to almost kind of reset our communications with the people of Fife around where they should go for assistance when they need it. So we can clearly explain what out of hours GP service will look like, what community pharmacy can deliver when it is appropriate to go uh, to A&E and, and, and where uh, other support, support can be accessed as well. The network of wells I've talked about. So one of the things we're, we're thinking about right across the system is, is how in the light of that decision about what the future looks like for out of hours, can we effectively communicate to, to the public uh, exactly where they should uh, go for assistance depending on uh, what the nature of the, their issue is. And, and we think that's a, a, an opportunity moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. And final question, Emma Harper. Thank you. It's kind of a sup to the cultural aspects of health and social care integration. Um, Tricia, you said that NHS Fife is one health board and Fife Council is one local authority. To Fries and Galloway is the same. So now I hear on the ground, it's the culture, it's the culture, and, and there's differences. And I'm aware of some research by John, Joss Kreese, he's a principal analyst at EduServe, that talks about the cultural aspects of um, deep-rooted differences in language, governance, processes, systems and performance management. So what specific cultural issues are you looking at that can help overcome some of the health and social care integration? Three years for me isn't it, a long time to change a culture as a person who worked in the NHS. So I'm curious as to what specific cultural issues might you have that might be different from others identified elsewhere? referring to is the way that the council operates and the way that the health board operates. At its most simple, um, the councillors who are on the IGB are elected. Um, they're elected to serve their own constituents. And the um, non-executive members who are on the health board, who are on the IGB from the health board, are appointed. So immediately you have got two different cultures um, sitting there in front of you. Um, and I think what we do need to do and what I do see progress coming is that, um, you know, people will realise um, that they've all got to work together for the good of the whole of Fife. Um, and that's what I meant about the cultures. They are quite different. I think there's also differences in um, terms of um, reporting um, things to their parent bodies. Um, for example, I mean, we've got um, a governance system that we looked at, you know, a couple of years ago. It's quite different for the way that um, the, uh, the council does things. Um, so, you know, I, I think... Um, I think it's about getting to know. Um, what I don't see is any difficulty of the health board staff and the council staff working together. 
I don't think there's any difficulty at all. I think, you know, people get that. I think they embrace that. I don't think that's a difficulty. If there is the um, difference in culture, I think I'm talking about at board level and not the work that's getting done on the ground, which I think is impressive and impresses me all the time. Paul? No, I... I, I so, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I think it's, it's about the coming together of the IJB as a, as, a, as a single entity and understanding it can have a wider voice. Now, it may be exactly the same in, in, in other IJBs, but I think the voice of the IJB owning the issues from both the council and health simultaneously is the key thing we're moving into. And we're starting to see that in the last six months start to grow more than ever in terms of moving those issues forward. Okay. I mean, clearly the Audit Scotland talks about both staff and members uh, having that uh, challenge uh, of identifying a common interest above individual interests. I, I suppose, Convener, I'd just like to echo what, what Tricia says. What, what I see uh, on the ground is real examples of innovation and creativity amongst staff uh, from across health and social care coming together to put the individual and, and their families uh, first. And, and there's a couple of examples I, I would give. We have a, a particularly uh, successful programme that we call uh, High Health Gain Individuals. So that's a programme that has identified uh, those individuals, main, mainly elderly and frail, who, who ha ha are making most use of, of health services, particularly those who are, uh, are being uh, regularly admitted to hospital on, on an emergency basis. So we've identified now somewhere just uh, south of 400 of those individuals and have developed an approach with social care and health staff coming together to wrap care around uh, those individuals. And we've already seen that in relation to those individuals, we've seen something like a 40% reduction over the last year in emergency admissions for those individuals. So a, a real example for me of health and social care staff on the ground coming together, putting an individual first. Uh, the other example uh, that I, I often talk about is we had uh, two services, two children's occupational therapy services in Fife before integration that worked quite separately from each other. Quite often, uh, individual ch children and their families would be on both waiting lists uh, and there wasn't a lot of communication between the, uh, the teams. Uh, we're in a position now where effectively those teams are, are working a, as one unit. We have drastically reduced waiting times. We've improved outcomes for the children and young people who are accessing uh, that services. We're delivering better services uh, quicker. So uh, there are a whole range of examples of where, where staff on the ground are, are, are coming together. And uh, I think that's really positive. As we've said, I think there, there's room for, for manoeuvre around how we come together, I suppose, at the top of our organisations around governance. But I think we're making good progress uh, there as well as, as we've described. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Can I say thank you to all our witnesses this morning uh, for their evidence. We will now suspend for five minutes and resume in private session. Thank you very much.